Okay, hello everybody. I think I have to um, thank the organizers for inviting me here. But um, I can't thank them too much because uh, I'm programmed at the same time as the first uh, match of the World Cup. And I think Russia is playing and I think there's a lot of Russians here. So I'm competing against a really hard competition. So uh, anyway, the first thing I have to do is I have to thank the audience for being here and not being watching the match. And I hope I'm going to keep you, um, well, not as entertained as if you were watching the match, but at least uh, preventing you from falling asleep. So, so my plan is to talk about antiferromagnetic uh, order in uh, bismuth ferrite. And, um, and well, there's plenty of pictures, so for, for those who, who are lacking the, 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 the visual side of the, of the circle match, I will do my best. I have little circle things as well. Anyway, so this work is, uh, so sorry, my name is Michel Viré. I come from, from France in the CEA, which is the, uh, the atomic uh, uh, energy, uh, like the Los Alamos in France. And uh, um, these are my collaborators, so um, people from, uh, from the inside in our lab, uh, mainly Jean-Yves Cholot, the guy who did uh, most of the measurements. Uh, then a few people from Soleil, it's the synchrotron source, uh, very close to where we are, uh, Nicolas Jaouen and... Uh, and uh, Oria Popescu, and then the Cineres Thales people, so uh, a group of uh, Stéphane Fusi, Vincent Garcia, Manuel Bibes, Agnès Barthélemy, uh, and then uh, the University of uh, Montpellier, uh, uh, the group of Vincent Jacques for the NV measurements. Okay, so um, I have a little introduction about what we really aim to do in the long run. So what we are aiming to do is to do spintronics with antiferromagnets, and uh, I have... Uh, Okay, the, the, the job is already done to convince you that antiferromagnets are, are really good. So we'll go quickly, but still I want to advertise a, a little bit more than, than what uh, uh, Professor Ivanov did this morning. Um, so in conventional spintronics, so originally people use ferromagnetic metals. Why? Because when you pass a, an electrical current, then you also have uh, not only a charge current, but also a spin current, and you can use this spin current to generate a spin population, for example, and then to play with that spin population. Now, the problem is, this is working very well in your computers. I mean, your hard disks are made of, let's say, spintronic components. The problem is that we are, we are reaching uh, uh, limits, actually very hard limits, which is uh, mainly due to dissipation. Uh, as soon as you have a current passing in a, through a conductor, then you have Joule effect, and this heats up, and this heating up is, uh, is the source of major problems. Actually, the main source of your computer uh, failing is uh, just the, the fan that gets blocked, and then the, the, the motherboard just, just melts, the processor melts. So, um, okay, one of the ways is to use uh, compounds, ferromagnetic compounds, but that, that are insulators, because at least you don't have charge currents, so you don't heat up, and you can try to work only with spin currents. So if you generate only pure spin currents in insulators, then you might be able to, uh, uh, to shortcut the problem of, of heating of your, of your computer. So this is one way. And there is another way that is even complementary. You can go, let's say, one step further, is by using antiferromagnets. So why would you use antiferromagnets? For a few reasons. So the first uh, reason is that it's completely insensitive to external fields. So if you were to write a memory with antiferromagnetic bits, then you will have a hard time erasing it. So any kind of spurious effect, any electromagnetic field or whatever, cannot do anything to it. It has no stray field. So because it has no stray field, you can imagine that your domains can be smaller than in ferromagnets, in which case you can imagine, again, densifying the information. So you can st stack more bits in the same square inch. And really, the, the main plus uh, is those dynamical properties that we already talked about. And uh, that, that would lead to faster communication. Let's say in order to copy your, tera your, uh, your terabyte hard disk, it might take you uh, 10 seconds with antiferromagnets, whereas it will take you, uh, I don't know, minutes uh, with, uh, with the present memories. OK, so uh, the best of the two worlds is to combine the two and, and to go to antiferromagnetic insulators. And then this is, um, this is great because of a few things, again. And the first reason is because that they are very common in nature. In fact, most of the magnetic compounds are antiferromagnets in nature, and uh, most of them are also insulators. So there's a huge choice with many different structures, symmetry you can play with. And 
multifunctional materials. You can you can uh, merge different order parameters and and act on one to play with the other one. And again, of course, they have superior dynamical properties. Why? Because the damping in an insulator, the damping is much reduced compared to a, to a metallic system because we do not have conduction electrons. And this, uh, okay, so this is a new field, let's say this is antiferromagnetic spintronics. Uh, this is an emergent field, but we know there are some really nice results already in the literature that uh, tend to show that, yeah, this could work. For example, here, this is uh, uh, the antiferromagnon in, in nickel oxide. It's at one terahertz. So this is the demonstration that these compounds could possibly work in the terahertz regime. Okay, so the prototypical antiferromagnet is nickel oxide, as we saw uh, earlier this morning already, and it has a lot of very nice properties. Uh, uh, and the main one really is to be uh, uh, antiferromagnetic at room temperature and above room temperature, about 600 K. So this is, a, this is a fantastic compound. It's an insulator. It has a, it has a large uh, gap and uh, it is cubic which may look simple, but it's not so simple um, antiferromagnetically. Why is this so? It's because you have, um, when you go through the transition, you, the 1, 1, 1 direction gets slightly compressed, and then this is along the, the antiferromagnetic vector. So the, the antiferromagnetic vector has to be along the 1, 1, 1 direction. So this is the direction of staggered field. So these are called the T domains. So here, for example, here is the, uh, uh, the hand-waving way of, of representing a T domain along the 1, 1, 1 directions. But then the spins, the spins of the L vector, uh, have also to be along uh, the, the symmetry uh, permitted axis, which is threefold here in, in that case, because they are along the 1, 1, 1 directions, which makes that for every one of these T domains, you have three possible so-called S domains. So which makes three times four, so which makes 12 possible antiferromagnetic domains. So in thin films, when you make a thin films, a thin film, then most of them uh, can be can be there in thin films. So if you want to deal with um, with this type of compounds, then you you have a huge problem of actually trying to either isolate one of these domains or to image them so that you can individually check what's happening in each of these domains. So one of the tricks here to reduce this number of of, of twelve domains, this is this is way too many for for us. We would like to image them. So this is way too many. One of the tricks is to use a multiferroic material. And um, because we are in multiferroics, we have coupling with another order parameter, you might use that second order parameter to erase some of these domains. For example, if we use bismuth ferrite, so this is the trick. I'm not going to present bismuth ferrite. We've seen it uh, many, many times here. But uh, the trick with bismuth ferrite is that um, P is along the 1, 1, 1 direction. And then because of magnetoelectric coupling, uh, your L vector cannot do uh, whatever it wants. So in particular, um, this magnetoelectric coupling will reduce the number of variants from 12 um, to actually, if you can write a single ferroelectric domain, then you have only three possibilities for the, for the L vector, which we, will see, uh, which we will see later. Okay, so we, we I'm going to talk about BFO. And uh, a few things about BFO. The first thing is, uh, let's talk about the, the magnetic uh, uh, structure of BFO, because this is what I'm interested in. So it's basically a G-type antiferromagnet, but it's a bit more complicated because not only you have the exchange and anisotropy, which are the normal common energies to have in, a, in an antiferromagnet, you can have the Zeeman energy if you apply a field, but also you have the two uh, magnetoelectric uh, uh, energies, uh, uh, the magnetoelectric, the, the inhomogeneous magnetoelectric uh, energy and the Chernovsky moria energy, which are actually the same from stemming from the same uh, mechanism, which is the coupling of E and, and, uh, and S or M or L. Okay, so these, um, these two energies are very important in BFO, uh, especially this, uh, the first one, the inhomogeneous one, which is the, the one that dominates, apart from the exchange energy, of course. So what that does is that this, because of this cross product, uh, makes a little angle between uh, every neighbors here. So this tends to have these long-range structures that are just cycloidal. So you can see here that uh, you have the up-down, the up-down. So the L vector, so the antiferromagnetic G-type, just tends to rotate uh, along some symmetry uh, allowed direction. OK. Uh, this, all this energy cannot be uh, minimized uh, analytically in the general case. 
So we have to do some approximations if we want uh, if we want to, to to find out exactly what the physics is. And if you if you take uh, exactly the numbers for the for the bulk BFO, this is what you find for the magnetic structure. You find that uh, the important energy term is so this uh, this uh, coupling between uh, E and M, so the magnetoelectric term. So this dominates in bulk, and because it dominates, you get these uh, long-range uh, cycloids. And the long-range cycloid is actually given basically by the, the ratio of the magnetoelectric energy divided by the exchange energy. That's what gives you the pitch of the, of the, of the, peri the period of the cycloid. And this period, you find about 64 nanometers for, for BFO bulk with the normal parameters. Okay, so this is a, this is a little tricky, but basically it's a G-type antiferromagnet with a long-range structure on top of it. Okay, so we are going to use multiferroics for the reason that it, it reduces the number of variants that, that we can image. And uh, also uh, for BFO, <coughs> we have a, a great thing added, a great uh, uh, particularity of this system, is that if you apply strain, you can kill the cycle of it, and you can recover a simple G-type antiferromagnet. So depending on which substrate you deposit your BFO on, you can have these cycloids in different directions, actually. And you can also have these, these purely G-type antiferromagnets like, like this one. Okay, so uh, I will present you a few things here, which are from both systems. Some systems where the cycloids are alive, and some other systems when they are dead because of strain. So let me, uh, let me start by... Um, uh, yes, and then of course we will. Uh, the idea here is to try to manipulate the antiferromagnetic order parameter or the chirality, let's say, of the of the spirals. Okay, so in order to do so, uh, for antiferromagnets, of course, we are much more restricted than for ferromagnets. For ferromagnets, we have imaging. We can imag image in uh, magneto optically. We have lots of different measurements, stray field, and so on, with an MFM. So we have lots of tools to actually image the, the, the magnetic textures for ferromagnets. For antiferromagnets, this is very different. And the reason why this is different is because the M average is actually zero. And then the stray field is actually also more or less zero. So if you want to image antiferromagnets, you, you are reaching uh, some sort of trouble. And you have, to, um, uh, you have to go further than for ferromagnets, and you have to use tools that are, let's say, a little bit unusual for people like me coming from ferromagnets. So we're talking basically about four things. The first one is second harmonic generation imaging. Uh, this, is a, this is a great technique that, that allows to image the antiferromagnetic order. Uh, I will talk a little bit, if I have time, but this is not sure, uh, about some uh, X-ray resonant uh, magnetic scattering studies in the synchrotron. I will talking uh, about uh, uh, PFM measurements, but this is purely uh, ferroelectric. It has nothing to do with the antiferromagnetic order. And then uh, uh, the NV center microscopy, which you will see is a fantastic probe to, to measure uh, tiny stray fields. Okay, so uh, let's start with trying to image these antiferromagnetic domains in this system where BFO is grown on STO. And when BFO is grown on STO, the strain is such that the, uh, the cycloids are not stable anymore. So what is expected in, in these systems is actually something that is a, a G-type antiferromagnet. But first, before, before checking the antiferromagnetism, one has to check the ferroelectricity. And if you grow a film, for example this one, which is 110 nanometers on, on, BFO on, uh, on STO, uh, when the as grown films have this kind of shape, so these are the PFM images, and uh, you can see here the out-of-plane and in-plane PFM, so basically, you have something that has a uh, lot of variants, at least four of the polarization variants. And uh, the domain size is about 100 nanometers. So of course, this is no good for uh, imaging antiferromagnets, uh, uh, especially in the antiferromagnetic configurations in these domains. And the reason why it's no good is because this is way too small. And with, with what we have, we, we cannot see in there. So just a word to say, okay, STO is here, so we are supposed to get this G-type antiferromagnet, and what we're going to, to use, oh yeah, sorry, one more thing, is that in every of these P domains, then, we know we're, we're expecting to have these three configurations for the, for the S, so for the L, let's say. Huh? So you have the three in-plane, perpendicular to P, directions at 120 degrees each. That's what we're expecting to see. 
So we're using second harmonic generation. Uh, this is a great technique uh, because uh, second harmonics are actually produced by, by anything that breaks the, the central symmetry. So you can have special uh, breaking of central symmetry, and this is, for example, for ferroelectrics, of course, the, the, char the plus charges and minus charges are not in the same, uh, uh, don't have rage at the same, at the same uh, place, so therefore you have a, a moment and it's not central symmetric. So this is a, this is a, a great thing, a great order to, to induce second harmonics. But also time inversion symmetry breaking also induce second harmonics. And time inversion symmetry, basically, this is anything that is magnetic. So ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic are all in there, time inversion symmetry breaking. And the interesting thing here with the second harmonic generation is that the antiferromagnetism and ferromagnetism break time inversion symmetry the same way. So basically, the intensity of this uh, second harmonic generation is going to be the same for a ferromagnet as for an antiferromagnet. So this, uh, this technique has been uh, uh, developed a lot by, uh, by Manfred Fiebig, who is now at ETH, and it has proven to, to, to give some, some really nice results. So we uh, set that up in our lab about two years ago, and uh, we got our first uh, images uh, about a year ago. And uh, here are the images. So we took a film, one of the films that I showed you before, and the first thing to do was to write a single ferroelectric domain. So this is the real trick, because we know that for a single ferroelectric domain, we only have three possible antiferromagnetic variants. And how do we write a, a single ferroelectric domain? We took a PFM, and uh, we used the trading fields, and then people in, in Thales were able to write th this thing, and this is the outer plane PFM and the in plane PFM, and we see here that we have only one polarization variant. So within this 10 by 10 micron square, we have a single ferroelectric domain. Then we take the sample, we shine light. So we shine light with the uh, femtosecond laser because we need a very high intensity uh, to have these second order processes of second harmonic generation. So we shine light at omega, then we have filters, and we detect uh, uh, the image at 2 omega. Uh, if we detect it at omega, we see something that is completely black, no intensity whatsoever. If we filter the omega out, and if we keep just the 2 omega, we find this kind of, of, of images. So straight away, we have, uh, we have contrast, we have an image. And the image is due to two things. First, we can see here the, the square. This square is exactly the single ferroelectric domain that was written. So this is the, the polarization, the ferroelectric order that we can see. And in, in there, we can see, for example here, that we have these little structures. So these structures are not due to the ferroelectricity because we know that it's a single ferroelectric domain. So already these structures uh, can hint at something extra, which is the antiferromagnetic order. Okay, so in, in order to disentangle the antiferromagnetic domains from these images, uh, the way what what we do, the way we proceed, is that we take we do the full analysis of rotating the uh, polarization of the incoming light and analyzing the outcoming light. And when we rotate the polarization, we can do the full analysis. And for every pixel, we analyze this full uh, uh, intensity versus rotation uh, intensity. And this is what we find. So we find the following. Every single pixel has the same shape. It has this big lobe here, plus something that is slightly asymmetrical. You can see here and there, this is asymmetrical on, on this one as well. So in fact, we have two populations of pixels, the ones showing this big lobe here and the small asymmetry in one direction, and big lobe here, and the small asymmetry in the other direction. And when you, when you model uh, what, uh, what one should expect, this, uh, this is what you get. So the gray lobe is the ferroelectricity. So we get this uh, on every pixel, of course, because it's a single ferroelectric domain. But this little white lobe here, this way or that way, this is the antiferromagnetic uh, um, uh, second harmonic generation. So on this antiferromagnetic uh, signal, can have two directions, this one and that one. And already we can see that the third, the third one that could have been allowed is not present in our films. And this is due to the fact that the strain of the film, it's a, it's a 2D strain because it's a 001 oriented film, lifts the degeneracy between these three domains. And these two are still degenerate, whereas this one is more energetic, it's more costly. So therefore it doesn't appear. So here we can then, pixel by pixel, reconstruct the antiferromagnetic image. This is what we get. And you can see here those red and blue 
uh, uh, domains are just domains with L in that direction and L in this direction. Okay. So this is the anti-fragmented image. And the scale here, uh, uh, so this is 10 by 10 uh, um, um, square that was written with, uh, with the PFM. And these little domains here are, let's say, of one, typically one micron size. Okay, so this is this is what we have. So now, now we can image them. So the idea is once once you can image, you want to to tickle them and you want to try to influence the antiferromagnetic order and see what what happens. So the first thing we did is uh, we if we get close to the to the nail point, which is 640 for for BFO, uh, and we come back, we can re-image and we can see that the antiferromagnetic domain has changed completely, just heating up close to the the nail point. That's one thing we can do. Of course, it's not very useful to write a memory. It's not going to heat up to 640k every time you want to write a, a memory. So why don't we do something else? And uh, the something else that can be done is actually the, the easy, straightforward uh, uh, thing, is to change the ferroelectric polarization. So you can again take your PFM. You can write a, 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 li a little domain. Let's say within that square, we wrote another domain here and another there with different polarization directions. And we can see that on the antiferromagnetic image, uh, we have changed completely again the antiferromagnetic configurations, especially in those squares. Actually, uh, in just in passing, this is a 2.5 by 2.5 micron square, and this is a, a single antiferromagnetic domain. So one can dream of just writing single antiferromagnetic domains just by uh, with the PFM tip writing a small ferroelectric domain. And um, a third thing we did which is actually very interesting, is we did the same thing as here, but instead of actually switching the ferroelectric polarization, you can be sub-coercitive. So you apply an electric field with the tip of your PFM, but it's sub-coercitive, so it does not change the ferroelectric polarization. So although it doesn't change the ferroelectric polarization, there's still some, some uh, electric field that will couple to the antiferromagnetic order. And when, when you do that, uh, you can see that after a certain electric field, you can change completely the antiferromagnetic order between this and that without touching the ferroelectric order. So this is good news because that means that you can independently write some antiferromagnetic information and some ferroelectric information. They don't have to be the same information. So already you have this kind of two, two level of writing. And probably the most interesting thing is, is this one, is that um, when now we hit uh, hard with our laser, so we increase the intensity of the laser, because it's a femtosecond laser, what happens when the femtosecond laser hits a, ferro, uh, a ferroelectric material, then it generates these, uh, these sharp uh, rectification uh, uh, um, spikes. And these spikes as in the are in the terahertz or picosecond range. And this, these spikes, actually, so the rectification of the, uh, of the light pulse, uh, what they do is that they are exactly producing some magnetoelectric type of field but at a, at a frequency that is in the terahertz, which is kind of resonant with the antiferromagnetic uh, uh, order. And uh, we, we notice that uh, we can, by just changing the incident laser uh, pulse intensity, we can completely change the antiferromagnetic domains again without touching the ferroelectric ones. So this is a proof that you can um, optically, let's say at the 100 frames per second time scale, address the antiferromagnetic uh, order in, in this compound. Okay, let's, let's now switch to something slightly different. Um, five minutes left, okay, this will be uh, uh, my last measurement. So this is the measurement, this is the following thing. Is, um, the idea here is that we have a probe which is uh, made in diamond. It's one of, of those uh, uh, defects in diamond. So it's basically you implant a nitrogen atom. Um, it positions itself close to a, to a vacancy and it makes these what so-called NV centers. And these NV centers photoluminesce. And the photoluminescence actually is dependent on the B field that is applied on your, on your NV center. So any kind of a field applied on your NV center splits uh, your, um, uh, your photoluminescence peaks. And this can be measured very accurately. And this is a fantastic probe to measure a tiny field. So this can measure fields typically of micro Teslas. And it's uh, located in a, in a kind of a one atom. So it has the, uh, the capabilities of imaging tiny things with a special resolution of the order of a kind of nanometer resolution. The problem is to have your 
NV center exactly at the apex of the tip, and this is kind of difficult. So you can never have it exactly at the apex of the tip. It's typically 50 nanometers inside the tip. And this is what, what sets the, uh, the, the sensitivity or the, the special resol resolution that you can achieve. Okay, so we took uh, one of these films, this time a different film, a BFO grown on disco. Here the strain is, is very small, and because the strain is small, you have these uh, cycloids in BFO. So the cycloids are there, and the idea here is that because there are cycloids, so you have this G-type antiferromagnet that rotates, so therefore you have a tiny uncompensated moment due to this rotation of, of L, and this tiny uncompensated moment could be measured with the NV center. So this is, this is the measurement. And so this is one of the films. You take your NV center, you scan it on top, and you find this. And you can see here, you have uh, alternatively red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, and this is exactly the stray field of the cycloid. So the cycloid goes this way, and the stray field goes, follows exactly the same thing. So you have this blue positive and uh, red negative things that you pick with your, with your sensor. So this is the, the proof in, in uh, real life of the cycloid, and this corresponds, these borders correspond to the ferroelectric domains, so you can see that in each domain, the, the k vector of the cycloid, the propagation vector of the cycloid, changes direction, as, as expected. Okay. So interesti interestingly, we can also be very quantitative with this technique. Oh yeah, sorry, be before being quantitative, we can also play again with writing ferroelectric domains. We can write single ferroelectric domains, check in there, and you can see that we have selected a single uh, cycloidal vector here. We can, uh, we can do that uh, on another domain in a different uh, polarization. You can see that the uh, cycloid uh, Q vector follows exactly what it, sh it should be, which it should be perpendicular to, to P. Okay, we can do now a quantitative analysis, and the quantitative analysis is actually, uh, is actually interesting. Because when you uh, exactly calculate what you should pick, if you have exactly this, so if you have just a pure cycloid that does this, if you know the period of the cycloid, then you know exactly the uncompensated moment. It's exactly proportional or inversely proportional to the, to the period of the cycloid. And if you know that, and if you plot this, so this is the model. The model is this little m uncompensated does this. It's of uh, 0.07 mu b per, per atom. This is what you find if you have a uh, a 70 nanometer uh, period. And then what you find is this is what you should pick. But instead, we measure actually about twice that signal. So the measurement is actually larger than, than what's expected. And the reason why this is so, um, this is what, I, what we believe, is because of this wriggling, in plane wriggling. So it's like a warping of the cycloid. And this is due to the Janowski Moria interaction. So this, ja this Janowski Moria interaction that is staggered. It, it induces this little warping of the cycloidal plane, and this induces another moment, but in a, in a different direction. And when you add this moment in a different direction, you can reproduce very well this, uh, the cycloidal uh, uh, signal that is picked up by the NV center. And you, you find that this Jarosky moria term is actually very high, and we believe that it's because of the symmetry breaking because of the interface. So the Jarosky moria term does not have to be the same as the bulk one, because of the interface, this breaks the symmetry and enhances uh, the D of the channel schemaria and makes a very strong warping of the, of the cycloid at the surface. Okay, I don't have time to present the synchrotron measurements, so I will go straight to my conclusions. I presume I am, I'm done, okay. So it's a pity, I have nice images, but uh, this will be for the next talk. Well, the next talk, if I'm invited. Next year, maybe, no? There's something next year going on? Okay, so my conclusions are here. Um, if, if one wants to do antiferromagnetic spintronics, we need to have a, a, a complete toolbox, at least to image the, the, the domains. This is a very important task. And this is what we are, we are trying to develop. So I showed you a few things. The first one that I showed you is the second harmonic generation images that we can get. And the interesting thing here is that we, we seem to believe that we can go towards an ultra-fast optical manipulation of the antiferromagnetic uh, order. Then you could see the images in real space of the, of the cycloids. And um, I think we, here we put our finger on this uh, role of the challenge moria interaction in the surface of these, uh, of these uh, uh, thin films. And then the 
the next time the cyclotron the the synchrotron measurements these are actually nice because they are the the direct proof that these cycloids are actually chiral so the chirality is actually measurable with the synchrotron uh, by doing the the dichroism of these of these spots and we also think that we might have some bubbles at the domain walls but i don't have time for this and i just want to uh, thank you for your attention